after the entanglement of this state, and we want to prove, I promise I prove, that uh, criterion generally whose violation is generally only sufficient for entanglement is also necessary in the case of two-mode Gaussian states. And this would extend also to M versus N-mode Gaussian states, actually. So we have... Oh, yeah. We have um, all the ingredients somewhere on the blackboard. One is the uncertainty principle, which take actually this form in, in terms of invariance. This is the complete expression in terms of invariance. It's, uh, so the determinant of sigma may be proven must be greater or equal to 1 than 1. Sigma must be positive because... These conditions being only quadratic in the symplectic eigenvalues can never uh, express strict positivity. I mean, they can't distinguish between positive or completely negative sigma. So this must be added up. Uh, but it's not a great concern, as we will see. And then there's this condition, which is less trivial, where not only the determinant enters, but also this other quantity, which is expressed in terms of the submatrices of sigma that way. Sigma, I remind you, is a two-mode density matrix. And it, is all, it also happens to be an invariant. Now, uh, yeah, so then also we have a, uh, we proved a, a lemma that is, well, we haven't quite proven it, but we have stated it, that says that if the determinant of sigma AB is greater than zero, then certainly the state is, the Gaussian state is separable. Okay, now I want to collect all of these, but first, in order to I have to translate the expression of the partial transposition, which is, w w which we we've given there in, in the Hilbert spa the Hilbert space level, in, on f in 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 phase space, and there, the way I'm going to do it is, uh, I'm going to use that part of the whiteboard. So why not? Because I don't need this any longer. That's the more uh, quantum optical part. And uh, and um, uh, what? And um, yes, so partial transposition in, uh, say, phase space. What is it? How does it act on these covariance matrices? So, um, that's why we're going to see it. Let's say, let's take one mode and let's understand what transposition is. More generally, transposition By the way, it doesn't matter which subsystem one transposes to check this positivity, and it doesn't matter which basis one takes. The reason is changing the basis that you're transposing with just corresponds to a unitary operation that doesn't affect positivity. Uh, and transposing the other system can be obtained by transposing the whole state. And the global transpositions will, again, not affect positivity, whereas partial can. So, so we can transpose in any basis, which is interesting now, because I'll uh, remind you the following relationship that you will be very well acquainted with from quantum optics. This is the Fock basis that I've never written down so far. But so the ladder operators on a single mode, this is transposition on one mode, a la mode. It's uh, that this is square root of n and minus 1. This comes from sol solving the, the simple single one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. Eh? So, and these are the ladder operators on which, you know, the only thing I care about in this story 
this would have been useful earlier when we determine certain properties of, of uh, some states. But uh, the reason why I care about this now is that these coefficients are entirely real. So I can express A and A dagger as on the Fock basis as some real operators, okay? Which has a bearing on this because now, uh, so what, what I mean is that uh, A dagger equals A transposed, okay? And therefore, in this basis, Therefore, let's see what happens to x. x is a plus a dagger over square root of 2. So uh, x transposed equals a plus a dagger over square root of 2. That is x. But, uh, but p equals a minus a dagger over i square root of 2, which means that p transposed equals minus p. Yeah, because a becomes a dagger, a dagger becomes a, and i is left. So I'm not, I'm not uh, Hermitian conjugating, but I am just transposing. So I get a pick up a minus sign. Yeah? So on a two-mode system, so, so transposition is the linear operation that sends x into x and p into minus p, which means on a two-mode systems, so partial transposition on two modes is um, represented by this matrix, which I'm going to call T, which is simply... this matrix that swaps one sign, yeah? So, huh, I'm working at the very far end of the whiteboard, but, of the blackboard, but, uh, so then, the partially transposed, so the partially transposed covariance matrix will be equal to T sigma T. And what this does, acting by congruence that way, because T transposed and T are the same. Uh, it will turn, it will, you can pick any one of the quadratures, it's the same in terms of positivity. And it will just, you leave all the diagonal terms alone and everything alone except for the elements of one line and one column which are swapped. Okay? Now clearly, we are interested in seeing how partial transposition may ever affect positivity. And remember, positivity is ex expressed by this uh, inequality. But then, so what will happen to the determinant of sigma? If I act with partial transpositions according to that T sigma T action. Yeah, so nothing happens because well, that's got determinant minus one, you multiply it twice, Binet theorem stays the same, yeah? So that is left uh, an affected, an affected, and this relationship is always, also always true, as I mentioned before, congruences, they can never affect strict positivity, it's unless, or well, congruence with anything that is not degenerate, so that's uh, Sylvester inertia law, that's how they call it. So this one is always true again. So sigma tilde will still be greater than, strictly greater than zero. So the only relationship which might detect a, a violation of positivity is this one. And we can just focus on this one then. Because delta will change. And what happens to delta is that the sigma A again will not change, sigma B will not change, but this sigma will be, so, so, so in, in that action, you will multiply by the identity by sigma Z, the off-diagonal block. And that will pick up a minus sign there. Therefore, there'll be a minus sign there. So, 
So then, delta tilde will still be, will, will change, will be equal to delta sigma A plus determinant of sigma B minus two determinant of sigma AB, which is, by the way, equal to the old delta, well, the non-partially non transposed delta, so these are the partially transposed versions, minus four determinant of sigma AB. Okay? And I think now we have all the ingredients. We need to check. So, PPT is if and only if, for a Gaussian state, eh, that's sigma minus, uh, no, actually, well, at the level of second moment. So, so for a Gaussian state, is if and only if, yeah. And uh, so now, fine, let me just uh, write down a map. <laughs> so, I mean, the, 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 well, let's distinguish a few scenarios. So, I want a table where I I'm asking, is rho separable or entangled, obviously, by converse? Uh, what's the sign of this and what's the sign of that? Now, now uh, let's consider all the possibilities then. So, uh, yeah. Um, if this is positive, we know that the state is separable, yeah? And we like this to be respected by what I just uh, fulfilled, by what I just uh, mentioned. And this will be the case uh, because delta tilde will be smaller than delta, yeah? And so this will be greater than, than, than this, which is always greater than zero, okay? So if this is the case, then this is always greater than zero, or equal, and the state is separable, fine. Then there's the case where uh, so this, if this is violated, there's nothing to say because this is going to be always entangled. Because a violation of this is like a violation of PPT. So if this is not true, then certainly the state is entangled. And that's general. So this criterion is sufficient at the level of second moments for two for non-Gaussian states as well to detect just detection of entanglement. Okay, so then there, as we like, we want that to be the case, and obviously this, it will also be true that this is smaller than zero. So the last case that we want to discuss, uh, and that will be done, is when. Uh, so if this is violated, but uh, what? Well, no, no, no. <laughs> if this is not violated, but, uh, but this is smaller than zero, what happens? Now, what happens is, in this case, it, well, if this is not violated, sorry, if this is not violated, so this is greater or equal than zero, then the partially transposed state is a physical Gaussian state. Yeah? And in particular, is also a physical, separable Gaussian state because its determinant of sigma b will be greater than zero. 
Remember, under partial transposition, that's the only thing that swaps signs. So this, this sign is switched to minus, OK? So if this is greater than 0, then the partially transposed Gaussian state will be a physical, separable Gaussian state. And therefore, even the original state, the original state will be separable too, because partial transposition preserves separability. Yeah? If you partially transpose a separable, you can detect entanglement, but if you start from a separable state and partially transpose, you're still with a separable state. And that's very obvious. If I put a T there, it's still a state and it's still separable, please. Uh, no, 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 because the one that correlates is this one. Yeah, not, not this line, as you see. Okay? We want to correlate with this check or non check. Yeah? So the general criterion, therefore, is just that this is satisfied. There's a very nice alternative proof, well, a much more elegant alternative proof that, was, that, that is pretty recent of this statement that is done with sure complements. But it requires a bit more of a matrix analysis, a bit of a, of a machinery that um, it's a bit unwieldy in a, small, in a kind of tight lecture. So this is easier to express. I mean, it's easier to introduce. You don't need that much uh, preliminaries. So slightly less elegant, but it's, it's um, so you know, using this symplectic invariance, we you can you can then show that this is the case, and uh, so therefore we've proven that PPT is necessarily sufficient for two mode Gaussian state. Um, let me give an example then of this and see. I mean, then we could go on and I could define the logarithmic negativity. This is left in I left it in the note. Where's my oh yeah, uh, but. Um, I don't want to do it now because it's, um, maybe I can just mention something else which is a bit more along the lines of quantum technologies as these lectures should be. I tried to give like a full account as much as I could. Right, so, uh, but, but first, before we move on, let me give an example of how to, how to check this entanglement. And, uh, yeah. So describing noise and noisy processes in, with these Gaussian systems, this is, this is a, also a formalism of Gaussian CP maps. It's incredibly uh, like, uh, um, efficient. And, uh, and it's, uh, these are very important kind, types of noise because they also, so bilinear means that you can reproduce all interactions with an environment that uh, is coupled linearly to the system, which is often the case in the Bohr mark of approximation when you have weak coupling and you're, perturb you know, you're perturbing the interaction with the, with the environment. So in open systems, that's a very, far, that's a very widely applied formal, um, situation. And then you can use Gaussian states only as probes of the dynamics, but then, but then you, can, you can use this formalism to build up the whatever master equation, but then you can apply the master equation to any state. That's a really good strategy to describe these open, these open dynamics. Anyway, noise is very easy to, to, to represent. I, don't, I won't have the time to do it, though, but I'll just mention this, that let's assume, let's take this state where, you know, I'll have this uh, big N that stands for noise times uh, a state which is iconic in... Uh, let me call it, and I'll write it down explicitly because it's good to see these things at least once. So this is a two-mode squeeze state. And it's the way you realize a entangled states in the generate parametric down conversion with these uh, nonlinear crystals that mediate interactions between two modes of light. And you have those pictures with those colored rings 
And in certain points in these rings, you have this process that uh, that's kind of like classical optics. Uh, so this is the prototype of an entangled state. If you let R go to infinity, this state becomes the EPR state. It's perfectly correlated in position and momentum, by the way. So it becomes a, a common eigenvalue of two commuting observables in X and P, in combined X and P. So it's what Einstein used eh? in the EPR paper. And, but just rather than just, so and for any R, you will have different degrees of entanglement, as we will see. But, uh, but um, um, the state will always be pure. If you, if you look at this determinant, which is incredibly easy to calculate because you get, uh, you know, cosh minus sine sheets one times cosh minus sine sheets one. So you get like always one. So the, so the state is always pure, but then I add this n, which represents the noise. It's an incredible, simple way, and it's expedient that this, you know, when, when, when one is lecturing, essentially. It means that the state will become noise, and it's become noise because of any process interaction with environment, thermal noise, whatever. So I want to see, and then the question I want to ask is, is the state entangled or not? Okay? So what I do is... Uh, well, let's just apply, there are more detailed techniques which would be to, to use this inequality. So you could calculate the smallest symplectic eigenvalue of the partially transpose covariance matrix and check whether it's greater or, lo or lower than one. That's a complete recipe. But at this stage, let me just use this equivalent statement. You could then calculate also the logarithmic negativity. I left it in, in the notes. So and try to quantify this entanglement, although that quantifier is controversial, so I don't want to get into that. But so here, determinant of sigma equals, uh, so this is 1, and then there's n to the fourth. Yeah? And then there's our delta tilde. And delta tilde is going to be uh, like always n squared times this plus that, so 2 cosh squared of R. This is called the two-mode squeezing parameter, this I. Uh, and then uh, plus, this comes with a minus, but then I have another minus, so plus yeah? So this Plus is decisive. Otherwise, I'll have a one there, and it'd be, it'd be some trivial, trivial. So it would always, if I talk, if I get, if I until that is, uh, so the non partially transposed relationship will have a minus there, and will just be always satisfied because the state is always physical, as we know, for any n greater than one. So that's a constraint. That's what the relationship will tell us that. This, this has to be the case for the state to be physical, whereas R can be anything uh, real. Right, now, so this is the equation that's going to tell us whether we are entangled or not. And this is simple because, you know, this is what, like, e to the, uh, what's this thing? Can you tell me? You, you're certainly much better than I am trying to figure it out. Uh, there's a minus and a plus and cancel out, but I'm going to write the wrong thing. Okay, I'll do, I'll do it then. No, I mean, like, I thought, uh, I meant, what, what is this sum? I'll, I'll, well, let's figure. E to the... Well done. It's cosh to R, yeah. Cosh to R, fantastic. I believe you because it makes complete sense. We'll see. And then let's check PPT. PPT says N4 minus 2n squared cosh 2r plus 1. Uh, so let's say we want to see, uh, write down a condition for entanglement. So we do this. If this is the case, then the state is entangled. Uh, 
And then, uh, okay, we just do it somehow. <laughs> so that is uh, cosh to R must be greater than uh, everything in there, blah, 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 to the 4 plus 1 over 2 and squared. That's the condition. So C and quantifies the noise. It's basically the number of photons, in a sense, but like, pfft, not really, because you know that also goes up. The energy also goes up with 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 R. Obviously, it's the trace of that thing. So the, no worries. I mean, that's not very relevant. But essentially, the two-mode squeezing must uh, overcome the noise. Yeah, this would be an increasing function of n of n. Pretty much, there's an n to the four of the numerator and. Um, and, and but, but we, f we define, this is a, a state which, you know, sort of like described fairly well what's found in certain labs. And, in, and it, it, so this, you know, these techniques are incredibly easy to then apply, yeah? D d this easy. <laughs> um, and we could determine, you know, how much two-mode squeezing you need in order to beat the noise. I mean, then there'll be like many other more or less realistic um, sort of um, scenarios one may devise and study, but doesn't matter. That's, I wanted just to exemplify how this works, right? So, and uh, yeah, so that's it as far as entanglement is concerned. We still have a bit of time, and I, but I know you'll be exhausted by now and there's still another <laughs> set of lectures after all these weeks. So I'll, be try, I'll try and be like, uh, Fairly uh, narrative in what follows, and um, right. So, okay, we won't need any of this, and I just say something which goes along more the quantum technology direction. So we saw some squeezing before in terms of like, as it is related to entanglement and what a squeezing operation, how it is described in terms of symplectics. But uh, you know that one, one of the interests of these systems is obviously sensing, because these are continuous systems which are good for analog sensing and estimation, like measuring stuff. And if you go very, very small to the quantum level, you will need, in the end, quantum estimation to measure stuff, or it would be advantageous to use it. And anyway, that is the fundamental limit to any estimation you can get, because it's the most fundamental theory of nature we have. So did you do this? Was there a quantum estimation bit in, this, uh, in the college? That was, were there lectures? No, no specific lectures about it, right? OK, so I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll just go through like a few of the basics, which is good too cover if you've never seen them. I mentioned a few things about Gaussian that we can, uh, one can handle with the formalism that uh, we introduced today. And then I'll add those to the notes as well. Right, so the simplest, like say vanilla estimation prob quantum estimation problem goes as follows. It's uh, Um, well, actually, let's start from classical estimation, let's say. So, um, although, no, okay. So the problem is as follows. Quantum Fisher information. Now, OK, say you have a process that is any general quantum process, could be noisy, or a calibration of some unitary operation in a lab. And say, for simply, to, to fix ideas and simplify things, that it depends on a certain parameter that you don't know. OK? So we want to determine this parameter theta that characterizes your operation. So what one would do in a lab is that you will write down a row which depends on a set of states, quantum states, 
of bounded you know, trace class operators. That will act on some fiducial initial probe. You set the probe, you let it go through the uh, phi theta operation, and so you def we define a set of states, okay? Then the only thing you can do in quantum mechanics is applying a POVM, measuring, yeah? And by which I mean some process such that this is the most general possible setting. So this is, these are the effects of the POVM. Yeah, some measure that will give you one. You're familiar with all, we, are you all familiar with POVM formalism? And, and, yeah? Okay, sure. Um, and then, and then, um, okay, and mu is the outcome of the measurement, right? And, and then you can sample this distribution. Once you fix, oh, by the way, when you have a quantum system, once you fix your measurement apparatus and you stuck with that, the problem, the system becomes a classical system in the sense that it will output, it will put out a classical probability distribution, okay? So you'll have a probability distribution then, which is given as, you know, so you have a probability of mu conditional on the parameter theta that you want to find which you can sample by doing the quantum measurement in a lab. Could be, again, homodyne detection or something that we mentioned before, but, or anything else. And this would be rho theta times, of course, uh, OK? So that will give you the probability of getting mu conditioned on whatever theta was. And we want to find out theta in order to understand what this operation was, the gen any general CP map, OK? But we don't need to care about these details, because we just have a set. The formal problem is just can be defined by deciding that you have a set of, of, um, of states that do that. Now, once this becomes a classical system, you can ask, let me just see what, how I write this thing. Okay. You can associate um, a probability distribution. So the solution to this problem, if you're sampling this probability distribution, is given by a quantity called the Fisher information. And by solution, you see what I mean. I mean, the Fisher information is something that depends in the quantum setting. It will depend on the uh, POVM we chose. And it will depend also on the value of the parameter, theta. And it will be given by, this is a classical estimation theory result. And, uh, P prime squared. OK, so, so by prime, I mean the probability, der the, der the derivative of the probability with respect to parameter theta. And whenever I put a prime in the following, that would refer to differentiating with respect to the parameter, the unknown, the, the parameter theta. So there are two slightly, dif the, so the notation is slightly ambiguous because there's the parameter theta and then there's true value of theta, which sometimes gets into each other's feet, but we won't really, uh, delve into any specifics. And uh, and this is important. It's the solution of the problem in the sense that there is a, a notion called Kramer-Rau bound, which says that if you're happy to quantify your uncertainty as the standard deviation of the parameter, that is the error in the lab, this must be greater or equal than 1 over square root of now n now is not noise, but it's how many times you repeat your measurement, how many times you sampling. There's always this scaling in square root of n uh, times the Fisher information. OK, so the, the Kramer-Rau bound can always be saturated within the assumptions that we're going to make and under certain regularities that. Uh, 
regularity hypothesis that um, they're, they're always satisfied for us at this stage. But the good thing is that, you see, in quantum mechanics, we had the choice of what to measure. So going back to the quantum problem. So now we can define something called the QFI, the quantum Fisher information, and call it, how did I call it? Ah, I theta, okay. And that is the supremum of all classical Fisher information under any possible POVM. By KM, I mean any possible choice of these POVM elements. Uh, supremum of I. That's why I, I kept this dependence explicit later up there. So the best ever um, result you can get in this regard is given by, and I also add this, basi this basics perhaps because of this, yeah, I think I can easily, I mean, the, the many books that I, could con that I could advise you to go through or reviews, but um, Elstrom has a classic book on estimation theory, for instance, although it's a bit, perhaps a bit dated. But also this, I don't know, Wiseman's book, Quantum Measurements and Control. Yeah. Okay, so, so this one there. Oh, okay, so this is, this is non true. I didn't prove this. This is a classical result, and, it say, and it's related to this Kramer Rao bound. So, this is the derivative of the uh, conditional probability with respect to the parameter. And you square it and divide by P, and this, this is the derivative of a logarithm, basically. That's why this turns out to be the case. Yes? Yeah, so, so yeah, so these convergences are not, uh, so this scaling is based on the fact that you have one system. But there are ways to think around it in the sense that uh, uh, in most situations, the, 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 this quantity will be additive. Okay? Yeah, but, so, but that's true. Uh, it could be different in certain, well, it depends on what this operation is, so, but yeah, and then uh, technically this is just for a single Hilbert space, right, so it's, it's, a, it's a Hilbert space result, and let me just define then what uh, the Fisher information is, I will give you a, a form which is slightly more, it's rho, Theta prime times uh, something that I will call L theta. And L theta is defined implicitly as the following that 2 rho theta prime equals L theta uh, rho theta. This is called the symmetric logarithmic derivative. And it's an operator that will depend on theta that does this. Essentially, if you multiply left and right, you are in something like that. You get the, the derivative with respect to the parameter. And also, it's a symmetrized version of this operator. You can see that you could have it non-symmetric, but you force it to be symmetric, and symmetric meaning like Hermitian conjugate in this stage, in this, in this case. And then, right, so, so that's what you want to determine. Now, there's no time for me to go through all of this. It, is, it would be impossible. However, 
let me give you uh, uh, just a bit, just an idea of how you will be able to do it for Gaussian states. Just a very rough idea. So this is a proper, this is an operator that has to do with the Hilbert space. You have to go to a Hilbert space description, in particular to the characteristic function description through the fourier weil relation that we just saw. And basically, you can prove everything using the characteristic function and using a trick which is a classic in quantum optics, and therefore, I would like to just show you that. That's a real building block of a lot of proofs. And um, if you take like, book, like classics like Barnett Radmore, which is like, I don't know, methods in theoretical quantum optics, I think that's called like that. I can't remember exactly. But they will uh, detail this in all its possible nuances. And um, it's, uh, it's a very fundamental trick. And it goes like that. So, so we use the characteristic representation, essentially, to try and uh, figure out what this L is. Uh, first off, we make an ansatz that uh, L theta is quadratic in uh, in the in the canonical operators. So I use my vector. Let me write it in components here. Uh, I don't really know why, but I thought I think it, well it doesn't really matter much. So it's some quadratic thing in uh, XMPs uh, with a linear part. We assume it because we're solving a Gaussian problem. We're just solving this under the pro Now we go to the Gaussian version of the problem, where the probe will be a set, so where this will be a set of Gaussian states. Okay? They are they'll be parameterized by first moments that depend on theta and uh, a matrix of second moments that also depends on theta. And therefore, so now I'm just going to give you the, the, a, a really basic rough idea of how this goes about. We use the characteristic function representation. And in particular, I say the characteristic, func characteristic function associated to some operator O, anything. It's, uh, it's given by, uh, OK, here I'm kind of cheating with respect to what I told you before. But, uh, but um, So I want to absorb that omega matrix. It'd be expedient to absorb it here in, in, the, in the redefinition of R. And I put this squiggle there on, on the notes as well. So I want to maintain it on the whiteboard. But this is essentially a shift operator, OK? So we just change the name of these variables. And the squiggle version is without the omega. And that's, I don't know, like, some operator O that emits a characteristic function description. So it's regular enough. And then, OK, it's probably easier that I do this because otherwise I'm going to get it wrong. So there's a classic trick, which is basically the baker -Kamp campbell ausdorf expansion of this algebra, which is simple because the algebra is central, as they say. So uh, this works that. Uh, yeah, so I can write it down as this, and I'll tell you what this is in a second. Sorry. So here I'm grouping from R, I'm taking all the X's, so one element every two, and likewise in this vector of uh, real uh, variables. And Likewise, then I'll have the P's. Uh, P. And then I'll have, so this is back Baker Campbell, Campbell Ausdorf. Uh, so I get, I pick up a phase. And in order to write it, uh, aha. Uh -huh. So that's the phase I pick up. Okay, 
But this is also equal. I can instead, in, I can invert this and pick a, 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 an opposite phase. So E I P dot P E I X and then E to the minus, which is key. Okay? So I redefine these vectors X and P as the list of X's and the list of P, and if you add them up as a direct sum, you form the old vector R. Okay? Yeah? And what I wrote here is just a version of this, of, uh, uh, yeah. This is true because then this commutator for us, it's always a number, and it commutes with A and B. That's what it's meant when, when they say that the algebra is central. So the, the first order baker campbell Hausdorff or consequence thereof is um, the whole story. And now, what I want to play, oh yes, now there's this trick, which is if you differentiate this, both relationship with with respect to one variable, let's say I differentiate partially with respect to P tilde J, uh, this all, I don't know, chi, then you get, uh, uh, you get two expressions, I trace of E to the I the T R, uh, blah, 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 times the operator O, which was the original operator, times PJ minus the one you get, you pick from the phase. So in this case, it'd be minus I half uh, Xi J Chi, or you get the same thing with trace of e to the i r uh, tilde t r p j o. Okay, so this is the crucial bit. p j o plus i half x j chi. So, let me clarify. Okay, so, so this equals that uh, means that is that that easy to see? Well, yeah, and it, well, Um, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, it's easy. So, for instance, we get a first result, which is that essentially I can rearrange this. I'm multiplying, it means that multiplying the characteristic representation, the characteristic function by xj is the same as the characteristic representation of, well, let me write it down then explicitly. So then, therefore, I'll just do it in this one case because we don't have any more time. But, so I put, it, I put that one the, this other way, and then I get trace. I get rid of all the i's. This is just some characteristic representation of what? Of, of Essentially, well, the commutator, but I don't want to call it necessarily the commutator in this case. In this case. OPJ 
uh, minus pj o. Uh, the trace equals x j chi. Okay. So remember that chi was the a characteristic function associated with the original uh, operator O. So if we want an expression for something where you multiply by pj right and left with a minus, so commutator in this case, it's the same. So the, the characteristic representation of this is the same as multiplying the original characteristic representation times function times xj. If you combine this, so then you can do the same for pj by differentiating respect to x, and you can also get rules for this differential. You get four rules which translate between the Hilbert space, and in the end you get this, uh, and the characteristic function representation. Uh, that delta r, the derivative with respect to any uh, variable, corresponds to doing this. I half multiplying by rj left and right as in an anti-commutator. OK? And, and instead, uh, multiplying by rj is the anti-commutator that way. By combining all of this, you can reconstruct what would happen to a Gaussian Wigner function if you, to a Gaussian characteristic function if you put it into this. So you express this in characteristic function form, and you will be able to map this one and obtain an equation which can be solved for certain just math, like quadratic matrices. In the end, you end up with a general recipe to systematically evaluate the single parameter logarithmic, symmetric logarithmic derivative and hence the Fisher information for all Gaussian states. This I'm going to leave in the notes because it's, it's too much. And there's also a simple expression for, uh, for single mode Gaussian states, which is more revealing, but it will take a little bit more to go through. And I think I've, yeah taken enough of your time. So thanks for listening.